Good evening. I'm Lynn Fridley, a program coordinator for Maddie's Institute. The topic of our webcast is update on FIV, what every shelter needs to know. At Maddie's Institute, we are committed to helping you find innovative, humane, and effective ways to keep animals happy and healthy while preparing them for placement in a new home. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Annette Litster. She is originally from Australia and has a really cool accent. She is director of Maddie's Shelter Medicine Program at Purdue University College of Veterinary Medicine, where she is an associate professor. Dr. Litster holds a Master of Medical Science in Clinical Epidemiology and is a registered specialist in feline medicine. Through her evidence-based research into FIV, she is passionate about establishing greater understanding and clinically useful approaches to this disease. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items that we need to cover. First, 10 audience members will be chosen in a random drawing for a door prize. Each will receive a copy of Maddie's Infection Control Manual for Animal Shelters. We will contact the winners via email, so good luck. Next, please take a look at your left-hand side of your screen where you'll see a Q&A window. That's where you will ask questions during the event. Dr. Litster will answer as many as she can at the end of the presentation, but please submit your questions early. Questions submitted in the last few minutes will not be processed in time for a response. If you need help with your connection during the presentation, you can click on the question mark, which is the help icon at the bottom of your screen. There are other little images along with the help button. These are called widgets. The green file widget will take you to the resources that our presenter wanted to share with you, as well as some from Maddie's Institute. The resources will also be available on our website after this presentation, so don't worry if you do not get a chance to review them during the event. Before I turn things over to Dr. Litster, I want to say a few words about Maddie's Fund. We are the nation's leading funder of shelter medicine education and it is our goal to help save the lives of all of our nation's healthy and treatable shelter dogs and cats. The inspiration for that goal was a little dog named Maddie who shared her unconditional love with Cheryl and Dave Duffield. They promised her that they would honor and love that they would honor that love by founding Maddie's Fund and helping to make this country a safe and loving place for all her kind. Please use what you learn here tonight to make the dream she inspired a reality. Dr. Litster, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you very much, Lynn. I'm very pleased and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight about a topic that I'm really passionate about, FIV. And uh, the, it's a very interesting topic, one that has um, attracted a lot of audience interest as well. So let's get started. So I'd just like to uh, give a run through of the presentation, uh, how it's laid out. To me, thinking about FIV, there's a lot that we know about FIV and I would like to update the audience about that, uh, about the prevalence and risk factors, transmission, diagnosis, clinical signs, vaccination and treatments that are available. There's uh, lots of evidence in the veterinary literature uh, from both naturally infected cats and experimentally infected cats uh, about those aspects of FIV. However, there's a lot of really good practical information that we need uh, still to gather about FIV positive cats so that we can look after them well in shelters so that we can make good decisions for their care and um, one of the main ones are the markers of disease progression and what I mean by this is how we know when the disease is going to progress from the, um, the so-called asymptomatic stage where there's really not much outward sign that the cat has FIV infection uh, and um, how do we know which ones are going to progress into symptoms, uh, clinical signs of disease, and which ones are not? 
what things should be, we be looking for. We also want to know how to uh, manage them, these cats optimally, how to look after them the best way we can uh, for both shelters and adopters, foster homes as well. We'd like to be able to give some prognosis. These um, types of things are very difficult to study in the field with naturally infected cats. We know that we get slightly different information from naturally infected cats to um, experimentally infected cats. So we really want to focus on naturally infected cats. And because most of the time this disease doesn't cause much in the way of clinical signs, you need really long study times to do that. So um, when uh, I partnered with the Maddie's Fund for the Purdue Maddie Shelter Medicine Program, I was really able to make a dream come, come true because uh, through Maddie's Fund, I had long-term secure funding for um, shelter medicine research. And so I've been able to do a, a long-term study of naturally infected cats. And this is something that's been really a lifelong uh, career goal of mine that Maddie's Fund has made possible. So the last part of the study, I would like to present what we are learning from the Maddie's Purdue FIV study, which I think is the most exciting part of all. So um, firstly, we'll go through what we know about FIV. You'll see as we go through the presentation that it's peppered with lovely slides of cats that are enrolled in the FIV study. And we start off with a beautiful photo of Tank from um, Georgia. And he has FIV. Uh, his main problem is that he's a bit too tubby. Uh, he is enrolled in the Maddie's Purdue FIV study. So we're just waiting for the next slide to load up. It's a little slow. So let's talk about prevalence and risk factors. And um, worldwide, the prevalence estimates vary between 1 and 14% uh, of healthy cats around the world. There are some areas such as Japan where uh, there seems to be a higher prevalence. Um, we know that the prevalence is higher in sick cats, but really it depends on the study design, the kind of information that you're able to collect. So um, it, it depends on the entry criteria, uh, whether all cats are tested, just healthy ones, just sick ones, that kind of thing. Um, Dr. Julie Levy, the director of the University of Florida Maddie Shelter Medicine Program, did a really large, very useful study of over 18,000 cats in 2004 in the USA. And um, she collected specimens from cats attending veterinary clinics and animal shelters. And uh, she found that about 3.1 cats presented at veterinary clinics were positive for FIV and 140 uh, and about 1.7% of uh, cats presented at animal shelters were positive uh, for FIV. In Canada, Dr. Susan Little performed another study and she found about 4.3% of the cats that she tested were positive for FIV. A um, statistical breakdown of uh, Dr. Levy's study showed that the cats that were positive for FIV were more likely to be adult, they were more likely to be male and intact, uh, they were more likely to be free roaming or have at least outdoor access. And if they came through a shelter, uh, the ones that were most commonly affected with FIV positive status were feral cats. Uh, there were about the same number of stray and relinquished cats you can see there as well. And cats were more likely 
to be FIV positive if they had current signs of illness. So there was another study done in the USA that looked at strains of FIV and um, this virus has a number of different strains. There have been seven identified so far. I'm confident that there will be more as the years go on. And uh, the seven identified so far are A, B, C, D, E, F and U. And in the USA, uh, you can see there's A, B, C and F. I'm going to also rep um, present some information later about what we found in the Maddie's Purdue FIV study. So I find transmission uh, a really interesting part of my work because uh, it's hard to know when you co-house cats, is the disease going to be transmitted or not? And so bite wounds are a really important part of the transmission. You can see a lovely photo there of Domino and his lovely teeth. Uh, he has FIV and he's another cat from the Maddie's Purdue FIV study. So the most common by far is bite wounds for FIV transmission and these have usually got to be deep bite wounds. They're not the kind of wounds that you can't really find after the cats look like they've really had a bit of a, an argument with one another but you know looked serious at the time but you can't find the wounds. They looked like they were biting but there's no broken skin. Those ones don't seem to be all that dangerous. Also documented, but much, much less commonly, the infected mother can pass the infection to the kittens during pregnancy, birth or lactation. It is a risk for blood donor cats. And there's also very rare transmission events just under laboratory conditions uh, where there's mucosal transmission. Uh, across the oral, rectal or vaginal mucosa. And these are so rare because with FIV, a mucosal infection, just casual um, transmission across a, a mucous membrane requires up to 10,000 times more virus than other routes. We know that fomite transmission is not important, so in shelters, uh, as long as you use your regular disinfectant routines, that should be enough to prevent fomite transmission. Also, there can be differences between strains. We know that from the laboratory. We don't have too much information from natural infections. So what do we know from the literature published studies of natural in, uh, of natural infections and uh, experimental infections when you mix non-infected cats with infected cats. And here's a table where across the top we've got columns for FIV positive cats, FIV negative cats that were in contact, and then the next column is any cats that became infected by being in contact with FIV positive cats whether it was a study done in a laboratory or a home and how long the observation period was. And there have been five studies in the literature. You can see the first three, the FIV negative cats that were in contact uh, did not become infected. The next one was a laboratory study and uh, it's not recorded how many FIV positive cats were but one of the 20 FIV negative cats became infected over a period of two to four years. There was another study in a home uh, with um, nine FIV positive cats and 17 FIV negative cats at the beginning of the study. And by the end of 10 years, six of those 17 FIV negative cats had become FIV positive. So this um, really inspired me to do a study on FIV transmission when I was contacted by somebody that had a large multi-cat household and they in fact had 138 cats in a closed household, they were mixed FIV positive and negative and our aim was to just document the FIV status of these cats living in this mixed household 
And my hypothesis was that in a stable household where the cats pretty well got along and were used to one another, that viral transmission would not occur. So um, just to explain about the cats, as I said, there was a stable multi-cat household of 138 cats. Those cats had completely unrestricted access to one another. All of them were indoor only, except for just one FIV positive cat who uh, also was quite aggressive, apparently, with his um, uh, housemates. And there was one FIV negative cat that did escape for a 12-month period. There was testing done on intake or close to the time of in intake. We're going to call that the FIV SNAP test one, and that's a, the normal SNAP test that many of you do in shelters that detects antibodies against FIV. And um, what we found was that in that a population of 138 cats, there were eight of them that were FIV positive. That's six male neuters and two female spayed. They were all spayed and neutered, these 138 cats. Their uh, average age was about 28 months. And um, of the FIV uh, negative cats, the 130 of those, there were 71 males, 59 females, average age of four months and uh, all of the cats were FIV negative. Then we followed up later with FIV SNAP2 and we were able to do that in uh, 50 of the cats, 50 of the 138 and those 50 there were five FIV positive and 45 FIV negative cats from the SNAP test one results. And uh, that SNAP test 2 was done an average of about 28 months after SNAP test 1 for each of the cats and the range was anywhere between one month and um, about 11 years. So what were our results? The FIV SNAP test results in all 50 cats were completely unchanged over that period. There were still five positives and 45 negatives. Uh, the FELV test results, one cat had uh, an, an FELV positive result. And uh, we even tested five of those 50 cats a third time and found exactly the same results. Uh, one of them at SNAP test 2 was FIV positive, four were FIV negative. At SNAP test 3, same deal. Uh, and of those five that had a third test, they were all FELV negative. So I like um, playing around with spreadsheets and doing some arithmetic. And so what I did was I looked at those 50 cats that we were able to get the second SNAP test result on after a range of times anywhere from a month later after SNAP test one to 106 months later. And I did some calculations uh, looking at the uh, entry date when, they, when I had the first uh, test results for them and when they came into that household for all FIV negative cats and the number of days that each of the FIV negative cats was exposed to an FIV positive cat. So for instance, if you're looking at an FIV negative cat on one day and on that one day there happened to be three FIV positive cats in the household, then that represents three days worth of exposure on that one day because that one cat is exposed to three FIV positive cats. And what I found was the average cumulative exposure duration for each of those FIV negative cats to FIV positive cats was almost 12 years, 11.98 years. They'd had all of that exposure in a closed household with unrestricted access to one another and they, they didn't change their FIV status, which I found very reassuring. So my conclusions were that even with mutual grooming, 
perhaps mild aggression. Uh, one of the FIV cats, positive cats, did like to groom all of the rest. Uh, another one, as I've mentioned, liked to fight with the others. Uh, they shared food bowls, litter boxes, etc., but they did not transmit FIV over many years of cum cumulative exposure in a mixed household. Um, it could be that how much virus they're carrying in their body and um, the type of virus, the strain of virus could be important factors there. We're not sure about that. And it's really a complicated mix of feline behaviour, virology and immunology that explains what's going on. But I think that the, this study really um, has got some very reassuring conclusions. Uh, when I tell you about the FIV study that we're, we're doing prospectively, um, there's a few other messages that I'm going to give you that FIV transmission can occur. Uh, I'm not saying it doesn't ever occur, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. So oh, we, uh, we have our first poll question. Yeah. This is your chance as the audience to chime in here. Does your shelter test cats for FIV on intake? <clears throat> your answers are yes or no, don't know, or not applicable. So please click on your choice and we'll look at our answers here in just a second. I see everybody is still answering, but let's go ahead. Wow, Dr. Litster, what do you think of that? Wow, that is very impressive, yes. And you'll see the recommendations are later on in the presentation, I'll tell you that you should be testing on intake and it looks like we're really preaching to the choir here. That's great. So, um, so thank you. Well, let's get on. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about pathogenesis, how the virus works in the body to produce signs of disease. And this is a lovely photo of Clarence from Memphis. He doesn't have FIV, but he's enrolled because he's a match for ACE. He also lives with Booth. And Booth is also enrolled in the um, Maddie's Purdue FIV study. Thank you, Clarence and Booth and Ace. So the FIV infection has a number of different stages. Those stages are not really clearly defined or completely agreed upon, but I will go through them for you. Uh, there's the acute infection stage, which is soon after the initial transmission of the virus. It's often silent. Uh, there's no clinical signs to be seen at all. Uh, there's large amounts of virus circulating in the bloodstream at this time. And you'll, you'll have heard perhaps about this term CD4 and CD8 from uh, human HIV infection. And... Uh, Now, CD4 and CD8 cells are particular types of immune cells. Uh, they form the basis of um, many parts of the immune response. And uh, CD4 are so-called helper cells, CD8 are so-called so cytotoxic cells. And both of those classes of cells decline. You'll hear me mention uh, those terms CD4 and CD8 immune cells during the presentation a little bit. So the response to the initial infection is that there are antibodies produced uh, and then that brings the amount of circulating virus down and uh, there's also an increased CD8 count. So the ratio between the CD4 and the CD8 count is reduced because that CD8 number is larger so that brings the ratio down. And we know from HIV that that CD4, CD8 ratio is a, um, an important indicator or, or marker of the progression of infection. 
then um, most cats then enter a long asymptomatic in, uh, period after the acute infection. And there can be progressive dysfunction of the immune system. While there is progressive dysfunction, there isn't always clinical signs of disease. Uh, luckily, um, as with most body systems, we have, or cats have, more um, of the immune system than they may need under particular circumstances, like being well looked after in uh, a small household. So um, while the immune system may decline progressively, it doesn't always result in clinical signs. The CD4 count declines, so again, there's even further reduction in that CD4, CD8 ratio. And there can be uh, non-regenerative anemia and the um, lymphocyte, total lymphocyte count, those are more immune cells, that goes down and uh, neutrophils, other, uh, another type of immune um, cell, that also goes down in uh, the CBC, the complete blood count. So it's mainly the cell-mediated immunity, so the, the type of immunity where cells are mainly involved in responding to infection. That's the main arm of the immune system that is infected. So the antibody-mediated um, immune arm is, can be stimulated because there's usually a balance between cell-mediated immunity and antibody-mediated immunity, and that balance can get out of kilter because cell-mediated immunity is reduced. So because of that imbalance, there can be an increase in the um, amount of antibodies or globulins in the blood. So there can be an increased serum globulin concentration. So we do know from previously published work that FIV positive cats can respond adequately to vaccination unless they're in an advanced stage of disease because we know that um, it's not only cell-mediated immunity that responds to vaccination, but it's also antibody-mediated immunity. So here is Athena. Uh, she has FIV, and uh, you can see she's another tubby FIV-positive cat, uh, all the more to uh, love her partner, Apollo, with. And Apollo does not have FIV, and they're both living together and um, both enrolled in the FIV study. So thank you, Athena and Apollo. And we're just waiting for that next slide to load. And just want to take you through some clinical signs and as, as I said earlier, clinical signs may take years to develop, if at all. In fact, uh, when we were enrolling FIV positive cats in our study, we found that 41 of the 89 FIV positive cats had no clinical signs at all on a physical examination performed by me. And this asymptomatic period can last for years. Uh, the clinical signs, of course, by their very nature, if they last for years, they're more likely to be seen in older cats. Common ones tend to be chronic inflammation of the mouth and the skin. There can be an increased susceptibility to various kinds of secondary infections. Uh, there can even be signs um, associated with cancer, especially lymphoma. Signs of uh, dysfunction of the nervous system or the kidneys have also been reported and slow progressive weight loss is something that's often seen. So just a, a few uh, photos here from the FIV study. Um, we can see at the top right there there's hair loss uh, without any inflammation where the cat seems to have just licked hair from its skin. Uh, it can be quite um, red, itchy and inflamed as well. We see that fairly commonly in FIV positive cats, as you can see with one of the cats there on the bottom left. 
Uh, chronic wounds was certainly a problem for the cat that's in um, whose leg is in the photo there on the bottom uh, right. But interestingly, uh, we've had a number of cats uh, that are FIV positive in the FIV study that have had operations or have had wounds and uh, there doesn't seem to have been a real problem with wound healing. But uh, this one really stood out in our memory because uh, this cat had particular problems with wound healing that can occur. Uh, chronic upper respiratory tract disease, if you really, um, if you've got a big screen you might see that this cat at the top left of the screen has mild signs there. There's a small amount of discharge from the eyes and the nose and that can be quite chronic. Uh, chronic uh, oral inflammation also can be seen especially at the corners of the mouth there. That's so-called foresitis. Uh, that responds well often to a full mouth extraction done by a veterinarian. So um, that's quite a common thing to get dental disease and oral cavity inflammation in cats with FIV. So we'll talk a little bit about diagnosis. Here is a lovely photo of Huckleberry. He doesn't have FIV but he is a match for Orange Yellow Mac and Huckleberry lives with Mnuchin also enrolled in the FIV study. Thank you to Huckleberry, Mnuchin and Orange Yellow. So we'll start with antibody tests and um, these are the ones that you're probably most familiar with in shelters. Uh, there's a SNAP test which you, there's a, a photo there, um, you'd be very familiar with the, the dots uh, on that SNAP test. It's highly sensitive and specific. There are reports of it being up to 100% sensitive and 100% specific in some studies. So it, we're lucky it's a really very accurate test and it detects antibodies. So it does take time for those antibodies to develop after initial infection and um, they may not occur for up to 60 days, sometimes even a year or longer. So um, it's generally advised that the testing occurs um, perhaps 60 days after infection. And you must use the test within two hours of opening the foil pack and then once uh, you've put the blood in the test, uh, you need to read that within uh, in 10 minutes. So you time it and read it in 10 minutes. And um, you should always keep that refrigerated. There is another kind of uh, antibody test and that's called a Western blot test. It's a send out test. Uh, it's offered by IDEX and um, it used to be thought to be a more specific test uh, but uh, there's been a study done by Dr. Julie Levy from University of Florida that in fact found that um, the, the regular SNAP test was more sensitive and specific in the study population that she had uh, than um, the Western blot test. So perhaps there's um, not as much need to send out as you might think. So as I said earlier, Usually antibodies will be detectable within 60 days of exposure but it could take much longer, 12 months or perhaps even longer if the viral exposure is low. Uh, there can be false positive results though and I think a lot of you are aware of those uh, and that's because these antibody tests just detect antibody. They don't know where the antibody has come from. So it may be that their antibodies produced in response to vaccination rather than infection. So if a cat has had an FIV vaccination then that cat can have uh, a positive antibody test uh, result that will persist for at least a year after full vaccination. We have a cat enrolled in the FIV study that is still testing faint positive nine years after the last FIV vaccination. Also if young kittens are born to FIV positive queens they're not always infected 
uh, by their mother. In fact, most of the time they're not. They can be, but most of the time they, the infection does not pass from mother to kitten. And, uh, but the antibodies do pass from mother to kitten. So the antibody test can pick up maternal antibodies and uh, again, that kitten may not be infected. They may just have maternal antibodies. So we'll talk a little bit about antigen tests, which are tests that are designed to detect um, viral proteins. And there's a PCR test. And because it detects virus rather than antibodies, it can potentially distinguish cats that are vaccinated but FIV uninfected from FIV infected cats. Um, the vaccine uh, virus is killed. It is not picked up by the um, PCR test. So if a cat is vaccinated um, but uninfected, uh, it can be it should be negative on the PCR test. If it is positive and the test picks up viral protein, that means it is infected. Now, uh, you should also bear in mind that this vaccine will not protect all cats from infection. So it is possible that a cat could be vaccinated and also infected subsequent to being vaccinated. So it can end up being quite tricky to tease out all of these results. And I'm going to present an algorithm on the next slide to try and help us do that. So um, the test does rely on um, adequate amounts of the virus uh, being present in the blood for it to register a positive result. And as part of the Maddie Spadu FIV study, uh, we did do some follow-up on this um, IDEX PCR test and we found that both sensitivity and specificity was approximately 94%. Uh, the test will also provide you with strain information, so you know whether it's A, B, D or, or whatever it is. Uh, there is virus isolation uh, and we certainly use virus isolation in the Maddie's Purdue FIV study that's performed uh, with our friends and colleagues at the University of Glasgow, uh, but it really is a reference technique and it, it is not available uh, to shelters and um, veterinarians in general. It, there's a lot of work involved. It takes at least 28 days to perform as well. So we need it for backup so that we uh, have um, absolute assurance of what we're talking about with our FIV study, but it really is a reference technique. So I'd like to present this algorithm here that's been uh, provided by um, IDEX and also it's based on information from um, uh, Dr. Levy and her colleagues uh, with the um, American Association of Feline Practitioners Retrovirus um, uh, Management Guidelines. And um, so we start off here with this orange box at the top left uh, and um, just say we get a negative test on our SNAP test. Uh, we can really pretty well assume that that is going to be an uninfected animal. If it's a positive test, then we might want to just check by repeating the SNAP test. Uh, you could try Western blot, but uh, as Dr. Levy found out, it, it probably won't get you much further. So you might want to use just another SNAP test for confirmation. And um, if the cat is um, uh, negative on the follow-up test, uh, which perhaps you might have performed later on, uh, maybe you've performed the initial test on a kitten and then uh, it's over six months old by the time you perform the follow-up test. If it's negative, you can say, well, probably the initial test might have been from maternal antibodies, but the cat now is, is it's free of infection. It always was. It was just maternal antibodies. Um, also, positive tests could be from vaccinated animals. Um, and um, so uh, if, we, if we want to really follow up on that, 
uh, whether it could be uh, positive from vaccine or not, we might want to follow up using a PCR test. And um, if that PCR test is positive, then that test has detected viral protein. We know the cat is infected. Um, we're, we're pretty sure that it is. As I said, uh, the test has a 94% um, sensitivity and specificity in our hands. So um, we're pretty sure that that um, positive PCR result coupled with the positive ELISA test result denotes a, a, an infected animal. If the, the PCR test is negative, that's inconclusive. It may well be that the particular strain um, of infection is not being picked up by the PCR test. There might not be enough virus for the PCR test to pick up. So unfortunately, with a negative result, uh, we don't get too much further in our diagnostic process with PCR. So time for another poll question. Over to you, Lynn. Yes, another poll question. Uh, I would like everybody to uh, answer the poll question in the poll area, not the Q&A area. And the next question is, which test does your shelter use to identify FIV-infected cats? The SNAP test, Western blot test, PCR test, we do not test for FIV, don't know or not applicable. So please answer in the poll area, um, and we'll look at the results in a few seconds. Which test does your shelter use to identify FIV-infected cats? Let's look at our results. Well, it's an overwhelming majority, Dr. Litster. Yes, and they're, they're using the most accurate test as well um, because, as we know, um, the SNAP test is the one that has the highest rates of sensitivity and specificity and the one that is recommended as an initial test. So um, th it sounds like this audience is really switched on to their FIV diagnostics. Well done. Okay, now we're um, going to talk about which, which cats to test. I've made a list here of all of the cats that really, if, if your resources are limited, you can't test all of them, but you want to know which ones to target for uh, SNAP testing. Here's the list. Sick cats, cats and kittens that are going to be group housed. And that's because of the possibility of transmission through bite wounds. Uh, if you're going to adopt cats out, and then you know if it's a negative test result, just to be on the safe side, you want to retest a minimum of 60 days later, just in case there was a subsequent um, infection event. Cats that have got a recent exposure to an FIV positive cat, uh, or perhaps a cat that you don't know what the FIV status is, especially if there is a bite wound that you can see and it's broken the skin. And again, follow up a minimum of 60 days later. Uh, and if a cat is co-housed with an FIV infected cat, it's a good idea to get that cat tested annually. We know from the study that I presented earlier that the high risk cats are outdoor free roaming cats and cats with bite wounds. So um, those are uh, good ones to test. And of course, if you are considering vaccination against FIV, you need to know the FIV status of the cat because after vaccination, they're going to test positive and um, you might not know whether uh, they are testing positive because they've been vaccinated or because they are in fact vaccinated and infected. Blood donor cats uh, should be tested because as we've seen earlier, blood donation from an infected cat can transmit the infection. So here is uh, Mnuchin. You heard about Mnuchin earlier who lives with Huckleberry. And uh, Mnuchin is enrolled in the Maddie's Purdue FIV study 
not because he has um, FIV, but because he's a match for Rocky. So thank you very much, Huckleberry, Mnuchin and Rocky. So I'd like to talk about treatments for FIV and basically they work on two different aspects of the disease. One is targeting the immune response to the disease and then we'll go on and, and talk about targeting the virus. Now there are many of these new uh, therapies coming out all the time and especially in conjunction with uh, HIV and then if treatments have proved um, useful for HIV, people are often wondering whether they'll be useful for FIV. There is a lot of work to be done um, in good uh, well-designed clinical trials in cats. So I'm just going to um, present a couple of therapies that target the immune system uh, that we do have some evidence for. So one is interferon therapy, uh, this recombinant uh, feline interferon. So this is interferon that's synthetically made and it is, um, it's a, an immune protein that uh, is the same as a, a cat's own immune protein called interferon. Unfortunately, it's not available in the US, uh, but it is widely available in Europe, uh, the UK and Australia for those of you who are listening from those locations. There was a study done with um, naturally infected cats, seven naturally infected cats, three were healthy at the beginning of the study and four unhealthy and they had five untreated FIV positive cats as controls, just an eight week treatment uh, period and they found that if the cats were healthy or mildly unhealthy, they just remained stable, there wasn't much change and that was four of the cats. The remaining three cats were unhealthy at the start of treatment and they did have improved clinical scores. There was another study done with oral human interferon that is available in the USA and it was a particular low dose regimen that was used and um, there were 30 naturally infected cats, 24 treated and 6 placebo over a total of 14 months this time and they noticed most of the improvement occurred in the first two months and that also over the 14 month treatment period treatment treated cats did survive significantly longer than those cats that were just on placebo. There weren't uh, changes noticed in that CD4, CD8 ratio that I mentioned earlier or other um, parameters on a complete blood count. So those did not seem to differentiate between uh, cats that uh, had uh, effects of disease and those ones that didn't. So there is also antiviral therapy and I just wanted to show you this cartoon. Here um, in the centre we have um, the the blue dome represents the cat's cell and you can see here there are these other virus particles that have got uh, these green spiky projections from them and you can see that the virus enters that blue dome, the, um, the cat's cell and um, it goes through the entry point of the cell membrane and you can see here I've marked this step number three with a red star because as it turns out that's where some of the treatments that we uh, use as antiviral therapy target. They target this stage where the virus has entered the cat's cell and it's integrating into the cat's own DNA so that it can use that to help the virus reproduce and then you can see at the other end that it it reproduces itself and then leaves the cell and um, that's how uh, the virus spreads in the body and reproduces. So we'll um, just present a couple of the antiviral agents. Uh, they're called PMEA and AZT and that's um, uh, because they've got long unpronounceable uh, chemical names. As I said earlier, they work on that step three in the cartoon 
And first one, uh, we've got some information about was AZT and that's the one that um, a lot of people with HIV that are living with HIV use regularly. And they did do a placebo controlled study uh, in cats with FIV and that they showed that that stomatitis or inflammation of the mouth uh, did definitely improve using AZT. They also found that that CD4, CD8 ratio improved. They used a three week treatment period. However, there were some um, side effects of treatment. Depending on the dose used, the higher the dose used, the more chance there was that the cats would become anemia, anemic, but that anemic um, condition did usually resolve in the first three weeks of treatment. It is possible uh, they found in HIV that uh, AZT resistant strains of virus can arise. So if the AZT was used on a chronic basis, it is possible that viral resistance could happen. Uh, and it's not really suitable for cats with signs of bone marrow suppression because of the dose dependent anemia that can occur. The other study that was done uh, used PMEA and uh, it was uh, a placebo controlled study with a three week treatment period and there was some clinical improvement noted but uh, there was more severe anemia than with uh, using AZT. So we're going to talk a little bit about vaccination against FIV and here is Cromie, uh, Cromwell. He has FIV, he's quite the character from Chicago and he's enrolled in the Maddie's Purdue FIV study. So vaccination, uh, the FIV vaccine is classified as non-core by AAFP vaccine guidelines. So that means it should only be administered to cats in specific risk categories where you feel that there's a particular reason that a cat is at, at particular risk of coming into contact and fighting with an FIV infected cat. Uh, the AAFP vaccine guidelines do not recommend this vaccine for shelter use. So uh, outdoor cats that fight or cats living with FIV, positive cats in unstable relationships, uh, perhaps you might consider that uh, for um, after adoption, but certainly not for shelter use. As we said earlier, um, we can't distinguish between vaccinated and infected cats using the SNAP test. So what we want to do is make sure if FIV vaccination is performed, that microchipping is also done at the same time so those cats can always be identified as cats that have been vaccinated against FIV rather than known to be infected with FIV. Uh, as far as the effectiveness of the vaccine goes, it is only made to be effective against subtypes A and D, but field trials have shown some protection against subtype B. Um, different challenge studies have shown anywhere between zero and 100% preventable fraction. So that's the proportion of cats that would be prevented, uh, protected by vaccination over and above a proportion that might be naturally resistant. So the um, effectiveness of the vaccine has been you know, very difficult to gauge in field trials so far. So for shelters, as I said earlier, it is not recommended for use in shelters or free roaming cats. And um, I was talking with uh, Dr. Levy about this earlier uh, in the week and really Shelter resources are better used elsewhere such as spay neuter or um, rabies vaccination program and it's quite an expensive vaccine to use because it requires at least three doses to be effect and the protection is strain dependent as I said earlier. 
there are strains here, uh, such as strain D in the USA, um, uh, that is it doesn't necessarily um, protect against, or strain B, sorry. Uh, so um, regru reduced aggression once they've been spayed and neutered should hopefully decrease their risk for um, being infected with FIV. And uh, also, if these cats are then presented later on at veterinary hospitals and shelters and they're FIV positive on a SNAP test, then um, disposition uh, decisions might be made that uh, are not really based on fact because people might assume that they're infected rather than knowing that they're vaccinated. That's why microchipping is so important. So over to you, Lynn, with the um, next poll question. We have another poll question here. Um, please answer in the poll area, in the slide area of your browser, um, and not in the Q&A section. Uh, does your shelter adopt out FIV positive cats? And your choices are yes. Yes, but only if they're healthy on a physical exam. No, don't know, or not applicable. Please answer in the um, slide area, in the poll area, and we'll look at the results in just a few minutes. Well, a few seconds. Does your shelter adopt out FIV positive cats? Let's see what we have here. Wow, yes, 36.8%. And 26% said yes if they have, have been deemed healthy on a physical exam. What do you think, Dr. Lister? That's pretty good. That is great. Yes, yeah, and there's some um, some shelters are doing wonderful things uh, with finding homes, good homes, long-term homes for healthy FIV positive cats. So, um, congratulations to all of you who are involved in that. So. So now the next part of the presentation, what we need more evidence about for cats naturally infected with FIV. Here is Daddy, he is one of the sweetest cats I know. He has FIV uh, and he's enrolled in the Maddie's Purdue FIV study. So um, hi to Daddy. And we're just waiting for that next slide to load. So here is Newt, we're going to talk about markers of disease progression. Newt lives in Memphis and he is a match for TJ. Uh, so Newt does not have FIV, but hi to both Newt and TJ. So we don't know too much about clinical staging uh, exactly um, about when the disease is going to progress or if it's going to progress in which in individual cats. And that was most of my motivation for starting the FIV study because I really wanted evidence to base practical decisions on. Uh, there is some information in the literature uh, that um, that CD4, CD8 ratio declines in the terminal stages. There's also um, immune proteins called interleukin-2 and um, tumor necrosis factor alpha. Uh, they're uh, proteins that are part of the immune system. They decline in the terminal stages. There's, there can also be a change in viral proteins and our friends and colleagues at the University of Glasgow um, have done a lot of work uh, with our FIV study on this. What happens is these viral proteins, the virus reproduces over and over again over um, uh, the lifetime of a cat that's infected with FIV and um, that virus evolves over many replications and generations of the virus so that there can be a natural selection of certain types of virus that seem to be able to resist the immune response of the host. That's why they're still hanging around after many generations and they may lead to progression of disease. So um, we're working on that to see if we can use changes in viral proteins to predict whether um, 
some cats will develop disease and other cats will not. Uh, viral load, the amount of virus in the, the blood has also been shown to um, be connected with um, uh, progression of disease and there was one study of 33 naturally infected cats. Uh, they were divided into cats with high viral load, cats with low viral load at enrolment and it was found that the ones at enrolment that had a higher viral load had a significantly reduced survival over the next four years um, and that viral loads did increase just prior to the cats passing away. So let's talk about prognosis, something else that's a, prog a practical problem that we need more information about. I thought this was a really fun photo of Amos. He doesn't have FIV but he is a match for Stormy. So um, hi Amos and Stormy, I think um, Amos is quite the bad boy in Memphis, Tennessee. And we're just waiting for the next slide to, slide to load. And so what we know about published evidence of uh, survival in uh, naturally infected cats is really not very much at all. Certainly no prospective studies such as the Maddie's Purdue FIV study. So there's been a couple of retrospective studies. Uh, one was a closed household where there were cats there that had FIV, some with FELV, some with feline coronavirus over 10 years. Um, 26 cats and uh, 9 of the 26 were initially infected with FIV, 6 additional cats were infected um, at the end of the 10 years and, but FIV did not seem to adversely affect life expectancy when they um, did some statistics on the survival of those cats. There was also a ret retrospective study done in Canada with 39 um, FIV positive cats, 22 FIV negative cats studied over eight years and there wasn't a difference in the survival time of FIV positive and FIV negative cats over that study period. So there have been some experimental studies that have shown that uh, subtype B might be more host adapted and therefore um, less pathogenic uh, and it really needs to be more work done on that. So we want to talk about uh, optimal management for FIV positive cats for shelters and adopters. So this is a lovely photo of TAC uh, who uh, is also from Memphis, Tennessee. She is an FIV negative cat who is a, a match for Wrigley. So um, hello to both TAC and uh, Wrigley. So what should we be doing in a shelter with respect to testing? We should test all cats before adoption or before group, group housing as we said before and um, follow up the testing 60 days later. Always use tests individually. You shouldn't be just testing a few out of a group or pool, pooling specimens. That's an unreliable way to test. Um, with TRAP new to vaccinate return programs, testing is optional. If you're going to spend the resources on testing, you've really got to have a plan in place for what you're going to do when you receive the test results. Uh, not everybody is actually going to change the management of their TNVR colony uh, in response to test results from FIV SNAP tests. If that's the case, if you know that you're not going to change your management plan for whatever reason, uh, perhaps resources would be better spent elsewhere than uh, to um, spend them on a test where you're not really going to take much notice of the results. You also need to make sure uh, if you're adopting out cats uh, that are FIV positive that um, you advise prospective adopters or foster parents about um, what they're taking on and uh, the, that 
HIV positive cats may need some extra care. We're going to talk about that very soon. And talking about integrating them into a household perhaps with FIV negative cats as well. Again, follow-up testing performed after 60 days. So, um, shelter management considerations. Of course, we always want to spay and neuter all shelter cats uh, especially all FIV positive cats. I think that's a given. We need to display the FIV status of all cats prominently in our shelter records and um, on the cage or the room where FIV uh, cats, uh, cats are housed. You should really house FIV positive cats away from kittens and sick cats uh, because uh, we know that their immune system may not be able to respond to uh, disease as well as a cat without FIV. So for their own protection, it's best to house them away from kittens or sick cats. And um, these are the things really that adopters and foster parents should know. They should really house FIV positive cats indoor only. Um, monitor these FIV positive cats carefully for clinical signs of disease, especially if there are multiple FIV positive cats in the same household. Um, they should see a veterinarian for a, a six monthly wellness check and if there are signs of FIV related disease, perhaps consider antiviral therapy in conjunction with your veterinarian. You need to explain the possible risks of transmission to FIV uh, negative cats in the same household and, and we've had a bit of a talk about that in this presentation. There is no evidence that FIV will infect humans. So um, we, uh, we don't have to worry about that side of things. So it looks like there's another poll question. Over to you, Lynn. Yeah, there's another poll question. I understand that a few of you are having difficulty in answering the polls. If you'll refresh your browsers, um, if you'll do that now, maybe that will take care of the problem. The next poll question is, if you adopt FIV positive cats, what kind of housing do you use for them in the shelter? And your, your answers would be either single housing, single cat housing like cages, room housing, but only with other FIV positive cats, room housing with FIV positive and FIV negative cats, don't know or not applicable. So please answer in the poll area, if you adopt FIV positive cats, what kind of housing do you use for them in the shelter? Please submit your answers. And we're going to look at the poll results in just a second give you all an, uh, a reasonable amount of time to answer this time. And let's look at the results. Dr. Litster. Okay, so we've got um, mostly single cat housing uh, or room housing but only with FIV positive cats and that's what we recommend. There are some people room housing with FIV positive and FIV negative cats and um, that can work out as it did in that uh, study that we did if it's a very stable household where everybody gets along. So thanks for that information, it's really interesting. Just move to the next slide. Here is Fiona. She is FIV positive, she lives in Georgia and she is enrolled in the, our study. So hi to Fiona. So I like to think of this, uh, the Maddie's Purdue FIV study as a tale of two cities because it's really been based in uh, Memphis, Tennessee and Chicago. So. Um, there are some, quite some differences between uh, the study population in each of the centres as you'll see. So just to go through the study protocol with you, it is a five year study and it's a controlled study because there are FIV uh, positive cats matched with FIV negative cats 
and um, they're all naturally infected FIV positive cats. The study started on January the 1st, 2010. We collect data every six months for the FIV infected cats and FIV um, negative cats have data collected every 12 months. They're all age and sex matched to each other. And at each data collection point, we collect information on a clinical history, general physical exam, a gingival score, so a, a score that tells us about the amount of inflammation in the mouth. Uh, and we do blood testing for serum biochemistry, complete blood count. We're interested in the CD4, CD8 ratio, and we also perform urinalysis. Uh, then that generates a, a report that we um, give the cat owners and they can take those written reports to their regular DVM to discuss them. And we also will send samples from all the FIV positive cats to the University of Glasgow Retrovirus Research Laboratory and to um, IDEX West Sacramento. Uh, if there are any necropsies, they're performed by the one pathologist at Purdue. And uh, because, as you'll see, we have a lot of cats in the one household uh, at Memphis uh, that are um, FIV positive, those cats are all weighed every month and uh, that cat owner provides um, that information for us uh, every month. We will check in every three months with every cat in the study by email and phone just to see how things are going and we remind all the cat owners that they uh, should contact us the moment anything happens. We like to hear as often as possible from all cat owners in our study. So, um, so far with the study enrolments, we had the first two years during which time we were able to enrol cats. The enrolment period has finished now and that was from January 2010 to January 2012. And at the time of enrolment, all cats were classified as healthy or not healthy. And by healthy, I mean that there were absolutely no abnormalities found on a physical examination by me. Uh, I'm not talking about any laboratory testing. I'm talking about just the physical examination that I can do with my eyes and ears and hands. Uh, not healthy if they had um, even one abnormality found on a physical examination, they were classed as not healthy and that was done at the time of enrolment. All controls had to be healthy. Uh, we in our group discussed this a lot and decided that if any control cats, because there was matching to the FIV positive cats, if any control cats were not healthy, then we'd have to match them on the type of disease as well and that would just be too difficult. So um, we made it just one rule, all control cats uh, must be healthy and then we will be able to uh, group all of our um, cats into different categories and do different types of comparisons over uh, different categories when we get all the results in. Uh, FIV positive cats can be healthy or not healthy at the time of enrolment. So here's a little cartoon that tells us about numbers and um, we have 89 pairs of cats enrolled, 38 from Chicago, 51 from Memphis. Now we'll just look at the Chicago arm of the study and there were 21 healthy FIV positive cats and 17 not healthy FIV positive cats. Um, three of the 21 healthy cats were from um, one particular shelter that did have FIV positive cats room housed together. They were only FIV positive in a room. They weren't co-housed with FIV negative cats. Uh, and there were seven of the not healthies that were from that shelter. All of the rest of the um, FIV uh, positive and negative cats were from uh, originally from shelters in Chicago 
but now with single cat um, owners or maybe an owner that had two or three cats. We'll look at the um, black arm on the right from Memphis. There were 51 pairs of cats of our 89 pairs enrolled from Memphis. 20 of the FIV positive cats were healthy on enrolment, 31 non -he not healthy. And I mentioned earlier that many of the cats came from uh, the one household in Memphis. There, was a, there were a, a lot of them uh, from that one household that had FIV uh, where there were many cats housed together that had FIV and some cats also co-housed that had, uh, did not have FIV. And 18 of the 20 healthy FIV positive cats were from household one. 29 of the 31 uh, not healthy FIV positive cats were from household one. So you can see there's some mix there of um, cats grouped in large households and cats that are kept in uh, smaller groups or even single cat households. So some results so far. The mortalities for FIV positive cats in Chicago, uh, there have only been four out of 38 FIV positive cats have died. Three of the four were from the healthy group. One uh, looks like the death was FIV related but the other two were not FIV related. Uh, one cat died of what looked like FIV related disease from that shelter where there were room housed FIV positive cats and that cat was in the not healthy group at the time of enrolment. In Memphis by contrast, 34 of the 51 or two-thirds of the cats with FIV that were FIV positive um, have died. Uh, 20 cats from the healthy group, 31 cats from um, the not healthy group and um, uh, most of these were from this large multi-cat household, um, household one. Now let's look at the mortalities in the FIV negative cats. Chicago, none of the FIV negative cats have died. In Memphis, four of the FIV negative cats have died. Two of the four were accidental deaths. Uh, two were illness related, one was from that large multi-cat household X and one from another large multi-cat household that was enrolled some cats in the study. So um, here's a table where we compare the FIV positive cats in Chicago and those in Memphis and you can see that um, I've done some statistics. So looking at the age at enrolment, the average age in Chicago was uh, four years old, in Memphis it was five and a half years old. Um, the number that were enrol enrolled in the healthy group, it was 55% of Chicago cats, whereas only 39% of, of Memphis FIV positive cats were enrolled in the healthy group. And, um, those enrolled in the not healthy group then, 45% in Chicago but 61% in Memphis. The time from the first known FIV uh, positive diagnosis until the time they entered the study on average was about six months from Chicago but two years in Memphis. So we don't know when these FIV positive cats actually um, had their their infection first uh, were infected with FIV. Uh, what we've got to do as a surrogate marker is have the time from first FIV diagnosis. That is as close as you can get with a naturally infected study almost all of the time. The length of time of uh, enrolment was also longer in the Memphis group, an average of 3.2 years. Um, whereas it's only 1.9 years in the Chicago group. And the multi-cat housing, um, 10 of 38 in the Chicago group, but in Memphis of those 51 cats enrolled with FIV in Memphis, uh, there were all 51 were enrolled in um, 
uh, from a multi-cat household. So you can see that there are some statistical differences. So in summary, FIV positive cats enrolled in Memphis are older. They've been known to be FIV positive for longer. They've been enrolled in the study for longer and they're housed differently to FIV positive cats from Chicago. So this may well explain some of the differences we're finding in outcomes so far uh, from the study. So a few more results. We found it interesting that um, there was quite a few of the cats that have died in the study did have lymphoma on necropsy, 13 of 38 or um, just over a third of them. And um, lymphoma was always found in the bone marrow, often in other sites as well. A lot of these cats, if they did die, they um, had a period of weight loss for at least three months and it was severe weight loss of over 10% a month. You might be interested after the other study that I presented that um, three of the cats that were originally enrolled in the FIV negative group have become FIV positive because they were co-housed with FIV positive cats. Now interestingly, all three of those cats had very significant bite wounds. They had to go to a veterinary hospital uh, to have treatment. Some of them were hospitalized and um, uh, two were from a large multi-cat household with mixed population and one was a territorial outdoor cat that was always fighting. So um, FIV transmission does occur under those circumstances. Uh, if there's going to be co-housing, it's got to be a stable household. Clinical uh, and laboratory results. We have found subtypes A, B, D and F identified in our population. Uh, there hasn't really been any association that we could draw between health status and the subtypes. Uh, we found those um, clinical findings that I presented pictures for earlier and uh, also, we have found that the CD4, CD8 results are lower in the FIV positive cats at the time of enrolment and over the study period so far. So, um, Shelter Medicine to the rescue. We're solving practical problems for FIV positive cats and what we really want to know is early information about which naturally infected cats are going to um, become uh, affected with clinical signs of disease so that we can advise, advise potential adopters and foster parents. Are there particular comorbidities such as say um, upper respiratory tract disease for instance which is very common in shelter cats? Does that seem to be a particular risk factor for argument's sake for the progression of FIV disease? Uh, changes to the immune response or viral loads, the cause or the result of clinical pro progression. You know, is, which came first, the chicken or the egg? We hope to find these things out in our FIV study. And we really want to know what the best possible management plans are for FIV infected cats in shelters so that we can give them long healthy lives in adoptive homes. So um, this study is um, the work of a large group of very dedicated, hardworking people and I would like to thank many uh, people that are in these acknowledgements here. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, it's been wonderful working with each and every one of you. I also want to acknowledge, my husband was saying to me the other day that I'm really standing on the shoulders of giants. These wonderful women uh, have all laid the foundation for the Maddie's Purdue FIV study and have contributed to it. Uh, Jules Beattie, Cinder Crawford, um, Dr. Margaret Hosey from the University of Glasgow and of course Dr. Julie Levy. Thank you to um, these giants in the field uh, who paved the way for me to come along with the Maddie's Purdue FIV study. 
Here are a couple of useful resources. You should be able to download these uh, full um, articles from these links. And I think we're ready for questions. Uh, Wrigley's going to lead us in. There's a beautiful photo of a beautiful cat. Wrigley has FIV and she's enrolled in um, Maddie's Purdue FIV study. Oh, Wrigley looks like my cat, itty bitty kitty. Oh, she's lovely. Um, the resources that Dr. Lister just mentioned are also in your resources. So if you didn't get to write them down, don't worry, they're there.